So, uh, so glad you're here. Um, big thanks to Claire on our AV in the back uh, and Zach for running the check-in table at the front. Um, and also to my um, co organizers and conspirators, uh, Shira Walensky and Megan Voller, who are here. Um, so, you know, this kind of event, sometimes I like to organize events that happen, that come together in different ways. Sometimes you're like, I want to see this thing happen in the world. Sometimes you're like, somebody approaches me and they have an idea and a desire. And this is a combination of both of those kinds of events where I was like, I'm gonna wanna do this thing about collectives. And then Megan and, and Shiro were like, we wanna do this thing on the occasion of Southeast by Southeast that puts Southeast by Southeast in dialogue with other groups. And then I was like, let's do the same event. So that's how this came together. If you're ever wondering how do events come together, it was a fusion um, of different interests and desires. Uh, and so really glad for you all to be here for this. Um, I want to plug an event that we're doing in January that's part of this series that is about cultural policy. Um, sometimes cultural policy feels like an abstract thing. You're like, what is cultural policy? But it is, it is the force that shapes everything from, you know, how does public art end up in public space to uh, the curriculum, you know, the arts education curriculum of our public schools and many other places in which art is integrated with society. So we're going to be in the, on the occasion of a mayoral of the mayoral election that's happening in uh, Philly in the spring. We're going to be having a, a forum on cultural policy on January 25th and hope that you'll be there. Um, and related to that election is a, is an election that's coming up even sooner. That is next week. So don't forget to vote. Um, that's my PSA uh, on that front. Um, and finally, um, I want to just talk a little bit about kind of the, the format um, for tonight. So we are, are lucky to have a bunch of speakers and decided to kind of go with a format where we get to hear from a lot of different people. Um, and so in the interest of time, I'm not going to read everyone's bios. Um, but hopefully you got a bio handout that, that gives a little bit more context about who's going to be speaking tonight. If you didn't, I will come off the stage and I'll give you a flyer when I'm done. Um, and so, um, but just to say, you know, a little bit about um, who you're going to be hearing from and how it's going to work. We're going to have, um, we're going to have four groups represented who will give kind of brief introductions to their practice, and then we'll all assemble um, on the stage for a discussion moderated by Denise Brown, um, Executive Director of the Leeway Foundation. Um, and so we'll start off with uh, Shira Walensky, who's gonna be talking about Southeast by Southeast, which is a community space um, developed through mural arts. Then we're gonna have Layla, um, and Issa, Leila Islam and Issa Matisse talking about the Future Is Us Collective. Um, and Leila is an alumni of Morse, so we're very glad to welcome them back. Um, and then we're gonna hear from Regan King uh, about Nomu Nomu, a group from Baltimore, and really glad to have you all up from Baltimore. And then, um, actually, that's the wrong order. I did just flip the order, sorry. First, we're gonna hear from Diane Wong, uh, speaking about the Chinatown Art Brigade. Really glad to have you down from New York, uh, Diane. And then, and then we'll go to um, uh, Nomu Nomu to round it out and then move into our discussion. Um, just, to, just to kind of conclude, um, we offered some prompts to people to, you know, be thinking about uh, with this event. We're, we're definitely trying to do a couple of different things. And I think that you'll feel that, you know, in the way that we approach the discussion and hopefully that offers some point of entry for everybody. Um, you know, we're, we're interested in having a multi-city dialogue. So we're really lucky to have people from, from Philly and, and Baltimore and New York. Um, and that's important, you know, to kind of build those bridges. Um, then we're also just kind of generally checking in and taking the temperature on how different art collectives and organizations are learning together at this moment, what kinds of things, you know, they're learning from the pandemic moment, 
um, what kinds of things it has motivated them to do uh, at various intervals um, over the last two and a half years. Um, and then finally, we're also here because one of the um, groups represented, Southeast by Southeast, has been around for 10 years here in Southeast Philly. And we also wanna celebrate that um, as a marker in time and come together and, and put uh, that practice in dialogue with um, work that is happening uh, in other parts of Philly and in other uh, part cities throughout the region. Um, so finally, I'll just say welcome to more College of Art and Design. This event is, is co-sponsored by Jefferson's uh, Humanities Program, as well as um, Mural Arts Philadelphia, and, and then the socially engaged art uh, programs here at Moore. And so these are the kind of dialogues that we host here and here with also with the art education uh, grad program. And so um, just in general, uh, glad to have you here and hope that we can all hang out and keep talking. We also have Thai food coming afterwards. And so if you'll join us in the, um, the courtyard outside, we'll have some Thai food and get to hang out with each other. Um, so please come, it's vegetarian. Um, all right, thanks, that's it. Now I'm gonna welcome Jane Golden, Executive Director of Mural Arts to, to give a, a, another welcome. So, okay. right. No, because we have a video. Can you, because we have a video recording? There's a video recording, so that it takes the best. I know, this feels so formal. Okay, so I'm glad to be here. So, um, Okay, just so, um, Daniel, first, thank you. You know, you're, you always do really interesting stuff, and thank you for inviting us here. Um, you know, the world has changed dramatically over the last number of years. I was just talking to my colleague, Denise, and we were just saying how, how does one build community when um, the community is shut down? And so the challenges have been abundant. And I think I want to commend all my colleagues in the cultural sector for being extraordinarily resilient and um, creative and really use their imagination to not stop. And so um, from, my, from what I saw around the city, I just saw people doing really interesting work to try to bridge that gap that was so present. Um, and I think what was very clear and is clear repeatedly is how important the arts are and how much um, we as a city don't acknowledge that enough. And so um, I think that our sector saw this time as both sort of saw the deficits and the wounds, but also the opportunities. And in some way, I feel that we came out of it more cohesive, and I've been doing this work like a really long time, I'm like a thousand years old. So, but I felt, I feel something bubbling in the ecosystem that gives me hope in spite of many hopeless situations that I see around our city. It's the arts, it's all of you, it's the culture workers, it's the practitioners, it's, it's students here at Moore. It's just a few comments I heard in the audience before speaking that I felt like, oh, this is, there's something percolating that is wonderful. It's like I feel the heartbeat. So I thank all of you because you inspire me and you inspire us in your arts. And then there is sort of a shifting of our practice, right? And how we get to dig in and be more intentional and consistent and present. And with the murder of George Floyd, there's just, there, it op it's like the Band-Aid came off and showed us the, the crimes of America, like that blood is on our hands. And so what's our responsibility? Well, it's deep. And we have to be relentless. And we have to go in with great, as a white person, great humility and lots of questions and be open to critique and to be able to course correct. And that is without a doubt. And then we just have to dig in and do more. And Southeast by Southeast is a really interesting example of why it's really important for us, I'm going to say me, to say yes when artists have ideas. Because I think our work at Mural Arts is infinitely richer because 
225 artists are employed every year. And what they bring to the city is truly profound. And so in walking up 7th Street, when Shira Walensky, her assignment was to do a mural, and she looked at me and she said, you know, we should have a space. We should take over a space. We should create a hub space. This is 10 years ago. We were partnering and still are with the Department of Behavioral Health in our Porch Light program, which is an awesome part of mural arts, very inspiring. And so our response was, yes, we should do that. And every time Shira and the team of artists in the community asked for something to make this program sing, we were like, yeah, absolutely. And you'll know that, like, I can't, I don't, I don't actually, you know, probably some people in the audience might email me about ideas. Like, I don't like saying no because I don't like hearing no. So people in city government, if they say no to me, I'm just going to go around them like they're forewarned. And so that relentlessness of spirit, I feel that's an obligation that we have to the cultural sector of the city. So by saying yes and having that door open and being a foundation so artists can come in and do their best work, things change. And so Southeast by Southeast, 10 years later, continues to thrive. And I remember, this is part of Monument Lab, sitting and hearing a conversation. And people talked about Southeast by Southeast as their space. They didn't mention mural arts. And that, to me, is a victory. That's a success. When the work we do is truly co-owned by the citizens across the city. And when I think about the 4,300 works of art that grace the sides of buildings in Philly, what probably makes me the proudest is that it's like the autobiography of Philadelphia, that it's not work that's parachuted down from the sky, that it's done in collaboration and connection, and it's resonant. It is resonant with the citizens who are here. Um, and that brings me to my final point, and that's where I started about the power of art. I just want to encourage everyone to keep going, to keep your practice moving forward, to know that we're here as a resource, however we can be helpful to you. And to know that when, I always say this, like that art ignites change and that can be like a jangled and you're just like, it's a cliche. But actually, from what I've seen, the impact on individuals, on communities, and by extension on the civic life of this city because, because of the arts is truly remarkable and magical. So thank you all so much. And just some, a few final thank yous before our panel starts. I want to thank, I'm always thankful to Daniel because he's like so open to ideas and more. Denise Brown, I love you. It's so good to see you. We're like friends from a long time ago. Um, Lee Wei is just does awesome work all the time. Megan Voller, thank you. And Jefferson, thank you. And this is going to be a great conversation. And thanks. I know everybody's busy and you all had lots of places to be tonight, but you came here. So thank you. Oh, and I have an announcement. I do have an announcement, I almost raised my hand. Um, tonight at the Barnes, we are announcing that we're doing a landmark mural that will be a tribute to black ballroom culture in this city and beyond. So stay tuned. Okay, that's it, bye. Okay, good evening. It is a hard act to follow Jean. <laughs> I just wanna say thank you, Jean, <laughs> for your support. Thank you to Daniel Tucker, thank you to Megan Voller, thank you to Denise Brown, and thank you to everyone who's here tonight. It's a real honor to be here, and a real honor to be here as a representative of Southeast by Southeast, um, a 10-year project working with new refugee families from Burma and Bhutan. Um, so just again, to give you some clarity, I'm an artist, a teacher, a photographer, filmmaker, muralist. <laughs> and um, I work for mural arts. I've worked for mural arts for about 20 years. And for the past 10 years, I've worked on the project Southeast by Southeast, funded by DBH, and run through mural arts. Okay, so Jane said this briefly, but when this project started, it was 2012. And um, DBH came to mural arts saying, we have... Um, about a thousand you know, new refugee families that have been resettled in Philadelphia from refugee camps in Burma and um, Nepal, in, in Thailand and Nepal. And I said, Jane, I, I don't know, I'm completely ignorant, I need to learn, number one. And yes, I'm 100% I'm interested in this. Um, so I needed a map, I needed a guide, who to talk to. I met a social worker, Melissa Fogg, and she introduced me to many families. And from there I became a listener. 
um, something that I love to do. <laughs> um, I learned that families felt utterly lost um, coming to Philadelphia with little or no English. Um, I learned that incredible women warriors, um, like an 83-year-old woman who had survived in the jungle, supporting six kids, was now in Philadelphia and was afraid of the stove. So what you see in that anecdote is like incredible knowledge from one world and how do you translate that into the next world? Translation was really a key. I thought the opposite of fleeing um, is having a safe space, a safe haven for exchange um, where new families could learn some English and um, we would have art programs, we would support cultural assets from home countries, and um, the social worker, community leaders, artists, and we all began to activate the space. Um, I worked on lots of mural projects, but I was really surprised when maybe like 100 families would come out, come out with, you know, for the activity and come out with electric bills. We've never had to pay a bill before. What is this thing? Um, all my assumptions about my life, my culture have, were rocked by this project. I am kind of forever changed by it, by both the great knowledge um, that communities arrive with and our assumptions about everything. <laughs> um, so, but we jumped in. And um, I think one key to this project was community leaders. Community leaders have guided us. They are the trusted keepers of um, community knowledge. So what is this collective Southeast is a little hard to describe, but it is a physical space in South Philadelphia. We've moved to three different locations. We are currently in the Bach building in South Philadelphia and we're celebrating 10 years. And so it's it's just a total honor and thrill and to, to be here. Um, the community owns the space. How does the programming happen? Um, I do some of the programming. I teach ESL there. I do photography projects. I do filmmaking projects. I um, have developed the projects over time. And also um, there are languages taught from home countries in this space. So I think having the space gave us so much freedom to say, here's the key. What do you want to do? And from there, um, everything kind of took off. Um, Okay, so I'm just, this image up here is an image from our show um, celebrating 10 years, and I'm going to plug it. We, are, we have a big opening next um, Thursday. We'll be screening intergenerational films, um, short films created with community members, and we have our photo exhibit. The question um, about what, you know, what is a point of pride for you in 10 years in the United States? So the question was open. And the answers came back. Um, gain, gaining citizenship was one. Um, learning some English, becoming independent here. Um, pride in your children was another one. Keeping your culture here, keeping your traditions. These are some of the things that you will find in the show and they really resonate with the practice of Southeast. Um, it is a project that um, values trust, that values listening, that values community building, that values time. Um, and if you, and also values language itself. Um, the films, the work in the show is in two languages. It's meant to be able to communicate to two audiences and see the amazing things that happen actually when those two, two worlds try to really meet in, a, in an honest and deep way. Um, the focus of our space is inclusion, um, preservation of language and culture, and thinking about language, the language of photography, which um, overlaps so well with my practice and community practice. Everybody has a camera. Everybody's communicating on Facebook, right? So there's this great medium that we have um, that is, I think, open, open very, very open. Um, so you'll see the quote, when I came to the US, I felt lonely. I went to Mifflin Square Park. I sat under a tree. I saw an airplane fly by. I wanted to jump on the plane and go back to Thailand. 10 years later, I don't feel lonely. That That is enormous. You've left everything. You've left your home. You've, you know, so, but you see this woman 
pictured at the bottom, that is her quote, Make Saw, somebody who I've known for 10 years. Um, I will just go through some images that kind of represent the practice of pride in language. Um, this is the Karen alphabet painted on part of a mural um, on a back of a jacket. Um, the value of community and collectivity. There are endless um, programs that came about through just like having the community come together, through being in that space together. This is a Karen language class. Um, value of photography as this common tool and great, great tool in language. Weaving, preserving traditions from home. So we've had weaving demonstrations, um, celebrating traditional crafts and finding ways um, to support that. Um, food also as culture, thinking about what is culture, what is art? Like food, Nepali food, Karen food, I've never tasted anything like it before. I'm now converted. Like, <laughs> And murals, murals are collective power. This is a mural celebrating 30 languages um, from home countries and dialects. And it was about coming together um, to create this with youth. And this is fi one final slide just to show you guys. This is our Making Home Movies project. Um, this involved filmmakers um, from Northeast Philadelphia, South Philadelphia, and Northwest Philadelphia representing immigrant stories and then coming together for our big events. And they were amazing. So that's a short, <laughs> short um, of a long story. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, hey everyone, um, my name is Layla Islam. I'm the founder and director of the Future Is Us Collective. Um, and I just wanted to say I'm super excited to be uh, back here for the first time since graduating. Uh, yeah, I'm grateful for this return and grateful to have this opportunity to share a little bit about our collective. Um, yeah, Issa, you want to? Um, hello, my name is Issa. Um, I am a organizer and co-curator alongside Layla. Um, we have been a collective since 2017. Um, we started off with about eight artists um, from different high schools in Philadelphia. Um, essentially, when we started the space or started the collective, um, we just wanted to give like sort of a safe and like pressure-free space to young artists in Philadelphia to uh, showcase their art and um, yeah. Yeah, I think another big component too about the founding and also like our focus now too is that uh, we are ran by youth as well as like we serve the youth. Um, all of our organizational team is made up of artists under 23. Um, and when we started, uh, it really developed from like these pop-ups that um, I had that I personally hosted and that uh, Issa was a frequent uh, contributor to. Um, and yeah, that developed to not only just having pop-ups, but also having uh, exhibitions. Um, and also with these like artist opportunities, we wanted to have this focus of um, basically having these opportunities free and um, accessible to young people. Um, particularly like when we started, it was mainly in high school, but now we're in this um, interesting transition as young adults where we're like interested in serving young adults and teenagers. Um, so that's a big, another big component of it. And um, I'll also just say too, as sort of a lot of coalitions have like experienced since 2020, we experienced like a drastic shift in like our focuses and like what we were interested in as a collective. Um, in response to shutdown, I think it was just like this, <laughs> like immediate need to like do something and like this desire to like, um, just not be at home by ourselves. And we wanted to like have this way of like connecting with people. So we started doing these um, engagements through our social media platforms, which then expanded to kind of like Zoom engagements. Um, the first project being um, something that's not pictured here, but was primarily on our social media page was the uh, digital archive. That's what it was called. Yeah. Um, and it was just this project where we were uh, highlighting teen artists and we were interviewing them about their experiences being in shutdown um, and how it was it, like, I guess, influencing their artistic practice at that moment. Um, and that kind of also developed to us doing another engagement that was completely virtual called uh, Camp Future, which was this virtual uh, festival where 
We had different free workshops, different DJ sets and artist talks. Um, and then that spiraled even further to uh, this hybrid virtual engagement that um, I kind of also personally developed when I was uh, in the process of uh, developing my thesis my senior year. Um, I think it came from an inspiration of two things. One thing being especially definitely um, connecting with people and finding new ways to connect uh, with community um, with the lack of opportunities that we physically had like at that time. But I think also the pandemic really highlighted for me personally uh, how crucial it is for us to have uh, healing spaces. Um, and I think healing is kind of like I try to see it as kind of like this broader term that can be uh, like explored, not just through like the traditional, like clinical and institutional practices that we're familiar with, but also like these more, I think I'm thoroughly interested in how it can be like this collective and group experience. Um, and so I decided to kind of like engage and study that and develop that through the Futures of School Residency, um, which you can see an example of like a program that we were doing like in our studio. Um, and essentially what the Futures at School Residency offers is um, it's a series of engagements and programming where participants engage in these healing art practices. Um, particularly, um, I'm really interested in somatic healing, so that was a big component of it. Another thing that folks were interested in and I was really interested in developing was these kind of like Afrofuturist methods of imagination. Um, and I was interested in that really with this belief um, in my heart that art and imagination and like these imaginative practices can really like create these spaces and offer these opportunities for collective healing, collective resilience, and then also like set this foundation for collective liberation. Um, and so that's been a big component and focus of like our programming and in our events. Um, I think also too, as a curator, I'm personally really interested in like cultivating experiences and like happening. So I feel grateful that I get to do that through the residency. Um, it's also a project that it started uh, for my senior thesis, like throughout last year into the spring of this year. But we also had the opportunity to continue that uh, with funding this year. So I'm super grateful for that. Um, it will be concluding in May of next year uh, with a show at the Paul Robeson House, which we're super excited for. Um, but other than that, yeah, so that's been our like focuses and what we've been interested in as of late in response to the pandemic. Um, and then in addition to that, we also have, which I mentioned, like our studio, um, that's primarily like where we do our programming, but also like it's just pretty much just free space for teens and uh, young people to create art. Um, we allow people to reserve the space and create uh, with extremely low cost. It's really just like a small reservation fee for us to like, um, you know, like clean up the space afterwards. Um, but yeah, other than that, we also do uh, resource events. Like we have a yearly back to school drive. So that's another big component of like our yearly programming or our yearly schedule. Um, I'm trying to think of everything. I think you covered everything. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, okay, yeah, cool. Thank you all. <laughs> I'll just say too, I'm super excited for questions. I'll probably expand more of things. Well, we both will later. So yeah, thank you all. <laughs> Okay, yes. These are beautiful slides, by the way. <laughs> yeah, close your eyes, everyone, please. I don't want to give away the... <laughs> okay, I think that is it. So this is me. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm so, so excited to be here. Um, my name is Diane Wong. I'm a member of the Chinatown Art Brigade, um, and we're mostly based in Manhattan Chinatown. Uh, so we are an intergenerational women-led collective of Asian American artists, media makers, residents, educators, activists, um, driven fundamentally by just a deep love for Chinatown and the belief that aesthetic um, and cultural modes of production um, is essential to racial, to addressing racial and economic inequality, especially around issues of dispossession and gentrification. So as with gentrification in other cities. Um, there have been a number of visual changes in New York's Chinatown. So this is a map of um, the number of art galleries that have opened up in Chinatown since 2015. 
Right, there are over 120 art galleries and for-profit art spaces. And since the pandemic, there have actually been even more um, spaces that have opened up. Um, in addition to these sort of, these very visual changes, um, there are many changes that are happening behind closed doors. So a lot of predatory landlords have actually bought out large apartment units, um, rent-controlled apartments, and have used various tactics to evict low-income tenants for profit using various tactics, right? Shutting down heat, um, not providing basic repairs, et cetera. And so um, a lot of landlords have also taken advantage of the fact that a lot of tenants in Chinatown are not english speaking are undocumented, low-income, and just are not familiar with the formal court process, right, as a form of intimidation. Um, and so... The Art Brigade's work is largely in response to these changes, right? Visible and also sort of the, the invisible changes that tenants are facing. Um, in the fall of 2015, artist Tamia Arai, um, who's actually in the photo um, next to the Here to Stay sign, Betty Yu, who's holding the Here to Stay sign, Nancy Kong, co-founded the Chinatown Art Brigade. Um, and all three of them sort of have deep, um, histories of movement organizing in Chinatown as visual artists, right? Tamia Arai, who's the most senior member of the collective, um, have been, has been part of a lot of different uh, culture collectives in Chinatown from Godzilla, um, the Asian American art, Net art Network, to the Basement Workshop, to Yellow Pearl. And so much of the Chinatown Art Brigade's work continues in that kind of lineage. As a collective, CAB um, works in deep partnership with CAB organizing Asian communities. And um, CAB builds the power of low-income um, Asian immigrants and refugees across the city in Manhattan, Chinatown, and also in Queens. Um, CAB was founded um, in response to um, an increase in anti-Asian violence in New York City and across the country, um, particularly in the aftermath of the murder of Vincent Chin in 1982. And so since then, CAV has been organizing around various forms of anti-Asian violence, from evictions to um, police brutality, to labor rights, to um, fighting for sex workers, undocumented workers, street vendors, and nail salon workers. Over the last several years of CAV, CAV working in, in collaboration with CAV um, and their tenant membership base, we've curated um, a bunch of different projects. So this is a placekeeping um, walk led by those most impacted by displacement um, and housing precarity. This is part of our Here to Stay project, which was a year-long project with tenants that included um, a series of large-scale outdoor mobile projections addressing themes of gentrification, cult, um, community abundance, and um, just stories of uh, tenant victories. And so a lot of the, um, the, the, pro the projections that you see were curated over a, um, a summer of sessions of workshops with tenants uh, that included placekeeping walks and maps that were co-curated together over a span of several sessions that I'm happy to talk more about. Um, the evening of the projection, we had a people's pad where those walking by could write messages that they wanted to project in real time. And so this is just an example of what one of the messages looked like. Most of the messages were translated um, into English and, um, and Spanish. And so this is one of the projects that we have been working on with the um, tenant membership as well. It's called the Housing for the People Placekeeping Augmented Reality Project, where um, we facilitated a series of counter-mapping projects with tenants to uplift their stories of resilience, um, grievances that they have um, uh, uh, with the changes that are happening, as well as um, housing victories, right? I think when so much about gentrification is about leaving, the work of CAB really asks, right, what does it mean to stay? What does it look like to stay? Uh, we've also um, held art builds, intergenerational art builds that um, bring Asian American youth, activists, students, and organizers together to create banners for large-scale protests and actions. This um, was an action held in front of James Cohn Gallery in protest of Omar Fass uh, racist art washing exhibit. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with this exhibit. Happy to dive more into it um, later on. CAB has also partnered with youth organizers in Philly um, 
uh, particularly with Asian Americans United and Viet Lead, to design a series of um, visual projections that connect the issues of displacement, uh, deportation, and immigrant de um, detention. More recently, CAP has worked with Decolonize This Place, which is a movement based out of New York City that organizes around indigenous rights, black liberation, degentrification, um, and uh, the decolonization of cultural institutions. So in November of 2019, we actually organized an action in front of the Museum of Chinese in America um, with several Asian American youth-led organizations in New York City to protest former Mayor de Blasio's um, plan to build four new borough-based jails under the guise of closing Rikers. CAB is now part of a national network of organizers, artists, tenants, um, and practitioners from Los Angeles, Vancouver, Toronto, um, Montreal, and Seattle Chinatowns who are invested in making connections between gentrification, sex work, decriminalization, and abolition. So before the pandemic, we organized this convening um, called Coast to Coast uh, Chinatowns Against Displacement, which brought together issues of gentrification, um, sex work, decriminalization that was led by queer women um, and non-binary orga organizers in the city. The convening centered realities of um, poor Asian women, massage parlor workers, domestic workers, who um, are often most impacted by these various forms of, of displacement. And so in the last two years, our work has really sort of shifted to thinking about the role of Asian Americans in conversations around abolition, right? This work has, for us, been especially urgent um, with the construction of a new jail complex in the heart of Chinatown and the cross of responses that we've seen to anti-Asian violence, um, including calls for more police and punishment, right? And so as part of this work, we organized an abolition teach-in um, in, co in collaboration with the Asian American Feminist Collective and Red Canary Song to really just discuss how abolition um, shapes our collective work and our work um, for the future. And I'm just gonna end here. Thanks. All right, so once more, we're gonna zoom through these slides. Just close your eyes. We'll get to see all of them very, very soon. <laughs> all righty. So, um, hey, everybody. My name's Reagan. Um, I am going to be talking a lot about Nomu Nomu today. We are a collaborative art and activist space in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, our founder, Joe, isn't here today. He's currently in Mexico. So I'm going to be, again, getting into the history of Nomu Nomu really from his lens. And then I'll talk a little bit about where I come in a little bit later. Um, so Nomu Nomu was started in 2014 in D.C. Um, Joseph and friend Nora decided to start a collaborative where they initially were curating art shows in Nora's home. Um, and Nomo Nomo really began as a collaborative space, again, for artists to work more freely as well as to create contexts that were free of any commercial imperative. Um, art is a very institutionalized world. Um, even me, I come from like an institutionalized art like background. Um, and so it's not very accessible to a lot of people. And it truly was a DIY space in that regard. Um, and in 2016, Nora actually stepped down. Um, she had kids and um, she decided to raise those kids. And it's actually what contributed to Nomu Nomu's name. So Nora's um, nickname was Nomu because her name is Nora Mueller. She also had twins. Hence the name Nomu Nomu. So now everybody knows what it means because nobody knows how to pronounce it. It's based on Nora's name. Um, but yeah, after you know having kids, Joseph decided to take over. Um, and we started moving into smaller gallery spaces um, as well as other innovative spaces, um, even the streets of DC as well. And we slowly became more political too um, as the decline of the American empire became more apparent, as the rise of capitalism is taking place, neoliberalism, all these really. Um, and we realized that art was just more and more getting farther away from the cause and from art for art's sake. Um, and in 2017, Joe actually began studying curatorial practice at MICA. Um, and that's actually where I met Joe. We had a class together. I was studying graphic design there at the time. 
Um, and we began talking about moving this otherwise like semi-nomadic, but mostly in DC space to Baltimore City. Um, speaking of gentrification, um, we had lost several different spaces in DC to that process. Um, we both were already living in Baltimore, and so we felt like, why not just move Nomu Nomu there. Um, the reason for that is because, again, there's lots of DIY spaces that are already existing in Baltimore. Um, and we felt that we really could contribute to the community as we were a part of that community there with our vision. So in 2019, Nomu Nomu set out on a significant expansion. We established a nonprofit um, and we also acquired a physical space um, that took what was supposed to be a year um, to get into, ended up taking three years because of the pandemic and the shutdown. So we actually just opened in April of 2022. Um, and that leads us to today where um, activists, artists, and community members get to um, create together. They get to work together. Um, and so this is our team. We are a team of eight people. Um, not pictured is Nicole and BZ. BZ's in the crowd. So feel welcome to chat with her after. Um, but yeah, we are um, really just collaborating and trying to bridge that gap between activism and art. How do we make art accessible? How do we make it accessible to people who aren't going to go to college and study it? Um, and so it is a physical space. Um, we feel it is really important to have that physical space um, for this community to be able to access that space. Um, and we're an arts organization. We're working towards the liberation for the broader society from all of those perpetual systems of oppression um, that really still permeate that art world and make it really inaccessible. And so we're really working with community members, um, community-based organizations, artistic collaborating as a bridge um, to really mend those gaps um, and as a means to challenge the status quo. And we do that by curating um, radical exhibitions that assess really these histories of gender or sex or protests or what have you. Um, and we also provide space. So we have like free yoga, we have plant workshops, we have live music sessions. Um, we try to th make everything as accessible and by that a lot of times free um, for folks as possible. We have a food pantry for people who are in need of support. Um, and now we again have more photos to show. So I'll kind of round it up by that. Um, and just continuing to find ways to make this space available for all folks. Um, and art is not enough. Um, we need to do more. We need to figure out how to work together. And that is, again, really what we're trying to tackle um, with our work. And I am the designer, so I decided to put the postcard up here. I was hoping that I'd have some to like throw at y'all, but we're actually quite out of postcards. I did bring stickers, though. So if you really, really like what we do, then come grab a sticker from us. Um, again, thank you so much. Excited to get into the panel. Yeah.